Welcome to Death Metal Chronicles, episode number 13. Naked edition. Naked edition. Ranger panties apply. Yeah. So what's going on with you, Jose? Somebody's naked next to me. Who's naked next to you? El Catracho Indio uh, <laughs> next to me. Catracho? <laughs> Dude. I don't think... No, they're, they're not Catrachos, they're... Uh, Cachuas? They're Cachuas in uh, Bolivia. Cachuas. Yeah. Not Catrachos. Ca- nope. Catrachos are only Honduras, I think. I think that's all Central America. Is it Central? Mexico. Probably more. So what's going on with you, buddy? What you been up to? Nothing. Just doing every day. What is that? Oh, I had strawberries, but they're now gone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you drinking coffee? No, water. I had enough coffee already. Oh, okay. We have a mission tomorrow. What's yes. our recon mission tomorrow? Drop everybody off the airport safely. How many people are we dropping off the airport? Six. I thought there was like 15. Well, right now it's six. <laughs> it might be 15 tomorrow, <laughs> but right now it's six. We're going to look like a bunch of Haitians. <laughs> like... 45 people crammed in the back of a station wagon. I mean, what other way is there to do it? <laughs> There's only one way. Marines lead the way. Cool. <laughs> so for some military news, I was uh, checking out Special Operations Speaks. Uh, their website specialoperationsspeaks.com. And for the most provocative thing that I could ever come up with, me and my crazy-ass libertarian shit, (laughs) uh, from their article, report VA destroyed vets' medical records to eliminate requests for exams. An explosive report by the Daily Caller claims the Department of Veterans Affairs destroyed medical records of veterans in an apparent attempt to cancel requests for medical examinations, A committee called System Redesign reportedly took the action due to the growing backlog of medical claims by veterans. Here's a portion of the report. Audio from 2008 obtained by the DC The Daily Caller depicts the VA Greater Los Angeles officials plotting to cancel backlogs, backlog exam requests. I'm still canceling orders sent from 2001, said a male official in the meeting. And they linked some sort of thing. So here we go. Here's the comments. I really, I really like doing this from now on. I, nobody else is really focusing on the comments for any of the shows that I watch, even on YouTube or anything else like that. Because f- fuck what the actual article says. You know, see what kind of people are got in their own minds. So Phyllis Nichols said, This is beyond outrageous. I want to know whoever destroyed these records is identified and fired. Refuse to pay for anyone's treasonous actions via taxes. It's criminal and we must demand it be fixed now. This administration has a lot of damage control to do. And this guy, in all capitals, uh, Kathleen O'Shea, keeps spreading this unacceptable news to everyone. Beg them to stand up for our soldiers. If they don't care about our military, remind them that this is the health care Obama and Dems have forced on all of us. Nice. Hmm. What's your views? That's really, um, that's really uncalled for. There was no warning or anything. This is, this is real, right? I mean, mm-hmm. this is actual news? Yeah. Solid reporting. Well, why would they be doing that? To save money or just to, um... Well, normal insurance carriers will outright deny a claim when it first comes in. So, when... If you can destroy the medical records, because, I mean, if, if you've ever had to deal with military, you know, with medical records, it, you pretty much need to send out a bunch of Marines, put someone at gunpoint, you know, and interrogate five or six people just to even get your own medical records. It's that ridiculous. It is literally yeah. impossible to get your own records. Yeah. Actually, I was told to uh, make copies of my record, which I didn't. So... <laughs> If anybody's listening out there, 
and they're trying to get out or something. Before you get out, they're doing this. And give them directly to your lawyer and back them up. Right. If they're doing this kind of, these kind of things, then you should make copies, like, right now. Yeah. Now, on some crazy-ass libertarian shit, this is why I think that the next generation of military guys for America should be allowed to have their own medical. Now, other people may not agree with me, but I don't think that the VA serves veterans in an efficient and effective way. Now, it would be completely impossible to eliminate the VA because that's just not possible. There's too many veterans on it. And there's right. too many veterans, so you, we've got, you know, a population of 330 million, half that, so, you know, maybe 120, so maybe, maybe we're like 7 million veterans in America. Right. Somewhere around there. So, you have 7 million people, it's completely impossible to eliminate the VA, because they're, you know, beholden to it, because they're on it. My opinion is you should be allowed to have your own medical. I don't see why that... The military has to have medical for you, but this is also where you get into like, you know, should you just be paid monthly, a monthly rate for being in the military? No BAH, no basic housing allowance. Just for medical? No, no, just literally nothing. No benefits, no nothing. Just to get paid 20 grand a month, that's what it costs for a E4, it's about $20,000 a month to have that guy somewhere. So why not just get paid a monthly rate and then pay for your own medical? That's a lot of money. Some crazy ass shit. But I mean, when you think about it, though, you're not really making what you're making. I mean, what, now, what, when you were deployed, what did you make a month? Um, I made the same amount with some extra. Um, like with combat like danger pay. pay I got. Uh, I don't, I don't remember what it's called. Overseas pay. And um, I think some of the married, some of the married guys got a separations pay. Mm-hmm. But uh, other than that, it was just the same, the same basic, uh, basic pay that they. What did you make a month though? Was me, I made around fifteen hundred a month. You're a single guy, and you're an E what? Four. E four. Yes. Single guy E four fifteen hundred a month. Double it by. Add in retirement, it's about four thousand dollars a month, probably five. Adding right. retirement, medical, housing, all the other stuff, so the insurance for right. you to be out there. Because even though the military doesn't technically have insurance, insurance is a part of that. So that's shit. That's that's just five thousand dollars of direct cost. That's not even what it costs to train you. For training every month mm-hmm. for supervisors that have to tell you what to do and where to go and food you have to eat. Mm-hmm. It's 15000 almost for just one month. Yeah, they When if you earned it, if you actually got that money. Right. You could, and if you didn't have retirement, like if you only made cash, you right. could actually have a lot of money and have your own medical. And I, I don't, even though that these guys are coming out with something like this, like, oh, this is bad because of. The only thing they're trying to do is say, oh, we need to change the Veterans Affairs. But that's not possible. You can't change an organization that is a giant bureaucracy as fucked up as the mm-hmm. Department of State is. I mean, it's just not possible. I mean... Right. That's how I see it. I mean, and it's crazy-ass libertarian shit to even think about, you know, eliminating the VA, but mm-hmm. I think that's the answer. Yeah. But I don't know, like, when you get out... Are you saying I would still have medical? I'm um, to be. You wouldn't have medical. You have to save up your own money. Right. You have to have okay. your own medical, like any other. Well, I think, employee has. I think the way they, why they do it is so you don't worry about getting medical yourself. So they just take it off your pay. They just cut out the middleman and just you know, hide, or just you know, use the money already. They just take it out from your pay. Yeah. So. I question it because there is a lot more contractors now and a lot more contractors that are veterans. So a lot of us, well, I'm not a, a veteran, I'm a contractor veteran, so 
you know, I don't have VA benefits, but I know a lot of guys that do. And so they don't have medical from their contractor company, but they do have medical from the VA. Now, when they get injured, they're then reaping the benefits off of their VA as this unaccrued cost. So like medical costs are going to go higher because you have these people that are civilian employees deploying places, fucking shit up and getting hurt. So then if they use their VA benefits, then that's a cost on all the rest of the society. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's the scene and the unseen of Adam Smith. Adam Smith is an economist, a uh, French economist, and that's his idea is the scene and the unseen. So the scene is the window breaks or the guy breaks. The unseen is the taxpayers at large paying for a contractor who got injured mm-hmm. on his own self, you know, deployed but has VA benefits. Mm -hmm. So now you, you're working for your mom or, you know, doing what you do, doing admin work. So now all of us through our taxes are having to pay for that contractor who got hurt. Okay. It's it's unfair to the person who is just working and to you because it's your tax money is getting taken from you for God knows what. (laughs) Ready for some military times roulette? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is I'm dude, this is a new thing from now on. Fuck going on military times and like, you know, researching a story. Just military times roulette. Just just to see what they've got. Cause you fucking never know. <laughs> Here we go. That Obama guy again. Those fucking Indonesians. Oh, what are you talking about? Obama took to Garza, it tells Pentagon to plan for Afghan bowlout. Mm. Who would you like to carry? They're so good. That curry he made earlier was delicious, by the way. Thank you, bro. It was Japanese curry. It was very good. SMB's. Props. My thank you, my good sir. It was the bee's knees. Washington. President Obama has ordered the Pentagon to plan for a full American withdrawal from Afghanistan by the end of this year. Should the Afghan government refuse to sign a security agreement with the U.S., the White House said Tuesday. However, in a call with Afghan President Amit Karzai, Obama also said the U.S. could still keep a limited troop presence in Afghanistan after 2012 or 14 if the agreement is ultimately signed. He acknowledged that Karzai was unlikely to sign the bilateral security agreement himself, leaving the fate of the continued U.S. troop presence in Afghanistan to the winner of the country's April election. We will leave open the possibility of concluding a BSA with Afghan later this year, the White House said in a summary of the call between the two leaders. However, the U.S. added that the longer we go without a BSA, we are more likely it will be that any post-2014 U.S. mission will be smaller in scale and ambition. Tuesday's call was the first known contact between Obama and Karzai since last June, underscoring the White House's frustration with the Afghan leader's refusal to sign the security agreement. The White House has repeatedly said it will not leave American troops in Afghanistan without the agreement. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel called Obama's order to the Pentagon a prudent step, given the likelihood that Karzai will not sign an agreement. However, he said the Pentagon will, would also continue to make plans for a possible U.S. mission in Afghanistan after this year, which would focus on counterterrorism and training Afghan security forces. It's, I thought that's what we're doing right now. However. Agil will discuss the future of U.S.-led mission in Afghanistan with NATO leaders during a summit this week in Brussels. The U.S. currently has about 33,600 troops troops in Afghanistan. (laughs) Bullshit. (laughs) Down from a high 100,000 in 2010. Obama has has been weighing options from the Pentagon that would keep as many as 10,000 troops in the country after this year contingent on security agreement. However, some White House officials are believed to support keeping a smaller troop presence. The longer the decision takes, the more expensive and risky the troops 
troop withdrawing will become. With less time to move troops and equipment, the military will have to fly assets rather than to use cheaper ground transportation. If security pact is never signed, the Pentagon's biggest challenge will be closing large military facilities, including the Bagram and Kandahar air bases. Shutting down a massive base typically it takes about 10 months, but military officials said they are prepared to do it in, in uh, much shorter. <laughs> Although far more expensive period if necessary. Wow. Military officials said commanders will still like to have about six months to shut the facilities down. If there is no security agreement by late summer, the officials said closing the bases by the end of the year becomes more, far more difficult. Damn it, no comments! Motherfucker! How old is this? This is today, I think. Let's see. February 25th at 12.44 p.m. Hmm. You want to comment on this? What do you think? I don't know. Yes. You have some Marine buddies that are out there in Afghanistan, right? Um, not that I can recall right now. I think everybody's stateside right now. That's sweet. There's a lot of guys out there. It's like 50,000. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe... I don't know. None of my friends are over there. Over there There's right literally 50,000 Marines. Yeah. Well, that's like, uh... I think there are 120-something thousand Marines on active service. Or maybe in total, I don't remember. Wow. But, yeah, there's not, it's not a lot of us, but, you know. I call bullshit. Number one... America is the one who installed Cars Lang. So, <sighs> this whole thing about a bilateral security agreement, a bilateral security agreement is, I don't exactly know what, how that's different from a SOFA agreement. Well, let's look. Bilateral security agreement. I don't know what the difference is, so let's look that up. I'm not exactly sure how it's different. I've never actually, uh... <laughs> we need to get one with Switzerland so that they can come to Connecticut and help, uh... <laughs> help not have people get shot by the Canadian... Uh, Connecticut police. For having guns, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fucking insanity that's going on there. They're like banning AR 15s and like all kinds of other guns and crazy ass shit, and they're just like gonna turn it into like a police state. <laughs> it's complete insanity. But in any sense, bilateral security agreement would basically give immunity to any contractor or any uh, military guy there, which, because they didn't do that in. In a uh, in Iraq, and that's why um, all the troops, well, most of the troops that were not there under diplomatic orders, had to leave. Um, obviously, there's still Department of State guys that are there, and, and guys that do spooky stuff uh, under the uh, under the diplomatic security agreement. Um, so we obviously, because we still have an embassy there, and there's, shit, there's probably seven thousand Americans still in Iraq right now. Under, you know, and you got Marsoc and you got all kinds of other sweet, fancy guys that are out there doing their thing. Um, but this is the issue. We've grown up with this. Shit. You know, I met an 18-year-old Marine in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. He's a child. What the fuck is he doing in Afghanistan? Like, <laughs> you know, it just makes me think. You know, it's like, so, you know, I'm 28 and I first went out to Iraq in twenty five when I was 25. You know, so, you know, there's that. And, or maybe it was 24. But then, you know, I've met guys that are, like, really fucking young, or even guys that are older that have lost their entire youth to these fucking countries. You know? Yeah. It makes you old. Their youths are gone. I mean, like, their, their energy is gone. So now they're, you know, 30-year-old war veterans with three wars under their belt, you know, and they've... I, I just think it's insanity to think that 
And they're getting their doc, their medical shredded. That, and that's that's the end result because they have to figure out how to cut money from all these budgets. You right. Know? So, but we're signing bilateral agreements, which costs fucking money. Bilateral agreement means the American Department of State and the uh, the uh, U.S. aid projects and the um, Department of Defense Corps of Engineers projects can stay alive. Those are billion dollar budgets alone. I mean, billions of dollars go into the Corps of Engineers and Jesus Christ, gazillions of probably trillions into the Department of State budget just for being in Afghanistan. Like, why waste another dollar on that fucking country? Nuke it and move on. <laughs> if they're that much of a problem and they're that much of a threat, mm. nuke them and leave. And if they're still a problem, nuke them again. <laughs> Trying to spread democracy, you know? It isn't democracy if you're just installing someone else's government. Uh, I don't... <laughs> That's what we did with Karzai. We installed the guy. We overthrew their com- country, took out all the freaking leaders, everyone we could come up with, and then put up some shill who can, you know, he can speak English and speak uh, fucking Dari and Farsi, and oh, it's great. Now we have a, a guy who's trained and everything, and it's bullshit. And this whole thing is bullshit because it's like we installed the guy in the first place, so it's not like he, you know, it's not like he has his own views and whatever. Right. He doesn't get to use those views. He gets to use the views of whatever America wants him to, or they'll smoke check him and then put in some new guy. Right. <laughs> uh, but basically, a bilateral security agreement would basically mean that you'd be able to operate there, conduct operations, find people that are bad, smoke check them, or uh, interrogate them, or whatever you would need to do. Without with immunity, and that, that basically I could fund uh, whatever missions that are going on there amongst the USAID stuff as well. So you know, there's millions of dollars going to USAID to bring hope and change, and God knows whatever else we do, putting in wells and shit for people to have water and stuff. Because obviously their neighbors, like the Tajiks and the fucking Uzbek Uzbekis and Russians, can't do it. I mean, come on, right? Only America can build wells. And bring feminism and whatever else there. Liberty. God damn. And eagles. <laughs> so fucking mad sometimes. Because it's never ending. And no matter how much work that you do there, it's just fucking worthless. Yeah, I know. It's it's pretty stupid. They're trying to... Like, they, they already have their own culture over there. I don't understand why we're, we're trying to muddy up their culture with ours. It's like we're doing it by... We're doing it by force. Yeah. Be American. Or well, else. now we've actually raised Americans there. We, I mean, we have, like, Afghans that are more American than they are Afghan. I mean, they've grown up with our country there. We, I mean, we've been there for 12 years. And I meet these guys that are, uh, that are locals, that speak English better than I do, that their comprehension is better than mine in English. They listen to American music, they wear American clothes, they, dr- they drink fucking Coca-Cola, eat pizza every day. And they speak in English all day long, and they you know, speak their language whenever they have to, but they're American. They've grown up with Americans, with American food and music and clothes, and, <laughs> like, this is insanity. Like, we're exporting Americanism, and, like, setting up some sort of American number two, you know. <sighs> That's a, it's a, it's a reality that not a lot of people talk about, is that there's a whole entire youth population that is... American English speaking, American cultured. They're Americans in Afghanistan. Yeah, and they have visas too if they work for America. So they have to come to America. They get like whatever stuff, and they get a visa. So they have an American visa, working in their own country for America. Right. It's a it's a huge problem because what if that person gets radicalized? What if an American Death Metal Chronicles, the Naked Editions.
We need to start like a death metal band. I'm naked. <laughs> so how's school going, bro? It's alright. What have you been learning in school? I actually had a test today. What was your test on? Political science. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what we're talking about now? <laughs> Yo. So what exactly well, actually, what they ask you about? Everything about uh about my textbook, which we didn't go over. But that's okay, that's my fault. Because you weren't actually in class? No, I was in class. I took notes. I just don't know how to college well. So You don't know how to college well? Yeah. <laughs> but I think I did okay. Where is your marine at today? Is he in college? <laughs> So what, what exactly were the questions on the test, or, like... They were, um... They're pretty hard, but I don't remember any of the questions right now. <laughs> what, I guess, what's the general concept of what you guys are learning in class? What um, are you guys focusing on? Well, we covered ideology. We covered uh, justice and freedom. We covered... Uh, introduction to political science. We're just in the middle of the textbook. This is cool. Yeah. We learn about, um, well, the more, I guess the more popular ideologies like liberalism, conservatism, anarchism, socialism. Ooh, hey. Anarchy. Woohoo. Um, democracy. What are people's viewpoints on anarchism? That's a good one. Anarchism? Yeah. What are people in the class? Well, or what's your teacher putting out? I guess what the, the teacher the, the teacher uh, basically said, well, he tells us that anarchism is an optimistic view of human nature and how we interact with each other, and I don't I don't think it would ever work because people are different. Maybe. In, like, a small society. Like, really small. But, he considers it as, like, a joke. So. This, I guess this is his viewpoint that people would, would utilize violence against each other? Well, not, well, yes. Violence, yes. But that's in everything. But... In our anarchism, you just basically left by yourself, and it's not. I don't know what I'm trying to say. What's your teacher's viewpoint on what is an effective government? Oh, or political ideology. What about we have right now? A republic democracy. Do we have a republic democracy? I hope so. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. I don't even know what a republic democracy is these days, so let's let's look it up. Yeah, some of the, some of the guys in my class, uh, I think, commented that anarchism would work. But then again, in a small community, a democratic republic is strictly speaking a country that is both a republic and a democracy. It is one where ultimate authority and power is derived from. The citizens? I think there should be a question mark <laughs> after that. It's, I don't think it should be a statement. It should be like a, like a question mark and like, see also, Obama invades other country, bombs U.S. citizen in Pakistan. <laughs> question mark. Do you really have an actual democratic republic? <laughs> oh, I didn't know the, the Germans were a, a democratic republic. Huh. Yeah, it's everywhere. Azerbaijan is one. Huh. And Armenia. Oh, up until. Okay. Former countries self-described as democratic republics. <laughs> America needs to go on there. <laughs> yeah, where is America? <laughs> uh, current cu Current countries... Democratic Republics. I guess we're not on there. Wow, never mind then. I guess we're not a 
supposedly we have a, a republic form of government. So it's probably just under republic. Rep- Democratic republic. Because a democratic republic would mean that it's probably like... Wait. But they're probably referring to it differently, I oh, guess. Did I say democratic republic or republic democracy? I don't know. It's, well, it's the same idea. Unless they re- they think of it differently. Right. A republic. But it's a good question. So if, if America is a republic democracy... That where the right of the people derives the power of the government, is your country still a democracy if your sole global war leader gets to go into another country and bomb you and kill you because you may or may not be doing things that he doesn't agree with? Roosevelt did some crazy ass shit, but he didn't go to Pakistan and go smoke check an American citizen. I'm not a, I'm not saying that what that gentleman did was correct, but I will say that that's not that's not part of the Constitution. I don't care what the guy was doing. He still can be, you know, black bagged and interrogated for all they want. That's another that's different. I mean, but you can't just go and smoke check somebody because you don't agree with what he's doing, even if the person is trying to, you know, get weapons and overtake an embassy or conduct bomb threats or whatever. I mean, that's not, you know. A republic form of government is which the powers held by the people represent and the representatives they elect. Ugh, that's creepy. And uh, affairs of state are a public matter. And affairs of state are a public matter. That's an interesting one. Seeing that Hillary Clinton is still not and uh... Well, yeah, well, Hillary Clinton was the head of state during the Benghazi attack. Hmm. She's not in jail. Right. Affairs of state are a public matter rather than privately accommodated through inheritance or divine mandate. <laughs> See also, oh, what what is it called? Uh, oh, what, what was it? Uh, what? From the 1800s. Manifest Destiny. Oh. Massacring all of Mexico, killing off the Cherokee, and you, know, you have the, you know, the tra- uh, Trail of Tears, and, you know, well, then, then also include Manifest Destiny into going out into Panama and overthrow and Nicaragua and God knows where else and overthrowing their governments too. In modern times, the definition of republic is commonly limited to a government which excludes a monarchy. Currently, 135 of the world's 206 sovereign states use the word republic as part of their official names. Both modern and ancient republics are widely, very widely in their ideology and composition. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good read. It's always good to read it. Ah, most often a republic is a sovereign state, which also is a sub-sovereign state, entities that are referred to as republics, or which have governments that are described as republican in nature. For instance, article... I hate reading Roman numerals. Four. Four of the United States Constitution guarantees to every state in this union a republic form of government. Similarly, the Soviet Union was a constitutionally described as unitary federal multinational state, composed of 15 republics, oh, two of which, Ukraine and Belarus, had their own seats at the United Nations. Which is very important that they put that, because I'm, I'm fairly certain that America will be de-Balkanized, uh, which obviously happened with, you know, with the Soviet Union. I mean, the Balkans then just erupted, mm-hmm. you know. And they turned into sovereign, small little city states and big giant states and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, with America's own doing and overthrowing their government, but <laughs> the uh, overthrowing the USSR with you know paying people to you know d- dispose of their leaders and such. But <laughs> I don't know. What's your idea of a? a what would be what would give more people freedom, or what your ideal uh, idea of a, of a government would be? 
Um, a uh, uh, what's it called? What do they have in uh, Great Great Britain? Parliamentary style government. Yes, a pol parliamentary slash democratic something like that because then you have every political uh, party in government so so you know the common man doesn't like he probably doesn't care about politics that much you know he's, no. he's working nine to five he doesn't give a fuck right? no. I mean the only the only uh, we don't really deal with the government too right. often unless we go to the, the postal only, service yeah the only reason he would actually uh, be aware of it if it actually affects him which which could be from pay or you know his health or whatever but other than that I think I think the government should be ran by by these political parties instead of just one person because they all um, participate actively in in uh, their beliefs and stuff you know you know what I mean would having a head of state or a head of war um, be a good plan in that sort of society? Well, security is always a must, right? I mean, you want to stay sti you want to stay safe. I mean, it's not like everybody's gonna own a gun or something. Should they not? I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm not saying everybody won't choose to. Everybody's not. Hey, I'm gonna buy a gun because I'm scared that something will happen to me. They might depend on their next door neighbor or their police in their, you know, county or their military, you know what I mean? So, of course you're, you're going to have to have a, a military. Do you have to have a standing army in your society? Um, of course. Would a standing army be good? Well, it, would, it wouldn't. I mean, or, I mean, would it be something that you would want? Well, I wouldn't use it. Personally. I wouldn't use it. I, in my government, I wouldn't use a standing army for uh, for aggression. I would just use it for security, you know what I mean? Just security for my people, not people over there. People so they there. wouldn't be allowed to have SOFA agreements, status of forces agreements, and say Iraq to enforce their laws? No. I wouldn't do that. That's their problem. What about a militia form of government, say like in Switzerland? Well, I don't know what's sw a, a militia military, which they're all, all of them are conscripted. Like you have to join the military at eighteen, but you don't exactly have to go anywhere either. <laughs> right. Sure, you have to go to military college and you have to do the military stuff. The same thing you did. Same exact training, probably too. Right. So well, it's, it's also part. It, you mean it could in your society like, well yeah work. that's that, that actually could work I mean there's a lot of countries out there that actually make uh, their citizens join uh, the military once they turn 18 uh, let's see Israel does it I think Argentina does it South Korea Argentina does it Argentina has a conscripted army really I think so yes I didn't know that I didn't know there were right? any South American countries that had conscription well maybe not right now but I know they used to or something I don't remember who told me but I know South Korea does. Pretty sure there are more. Oh, cool. Yes. They ended it. So Argentina suspended military conscription in 1995 well, and replaced it with volunteer good. military service. If it wasn't 1995, I probably would have been forced to go to Argentina to join the military. If I... Shit, yeah, because you were exactly. born there. Exactly. So that would have been a problem. Oh, it's fucking creepy, dude. That's just scary to me. Right? Because well, God knows where they want you to go, the Falkland Islands, and then you have to go fight the British. Well, and I mean, God forbid you'd be dating a British chick in America, and then you have to go fight her cousin in the Falkland Islands. Uh, that just fucking blows my mind. I mean, like, that's actually something that could happen. Right. And then Argentina goes to war with the Falkland Islands, which are a British territory, and then you'd have to go fight your girlfriend's cousin or brother, who happens... To be from there and be mm -hmm. conscripted into the British Army. Mm -hmm. Ugh, that's just fucking awkward, man. 
Only if you yeah, if you experienced 1982 Falklands War, which provided the superior professional servicemen over crime conscripts in the series of inscription-related brutality scandals, which came to the head in the murder of the private Omar Carrasco at the army base in 1984, following a brutal disciplinary action. That's well, intense. Well, the U.S. doesn't have a what's, what's it called Com- military conscription. We have well, selective service. Right, we have selective service. It's the same exact thing. Yeah, only a different name. I mean, they do it whenever, but we do it when we have a major war and we have a draft. <sighs> yeah. So in way. your country, I guess, would you not want to have conscription? That's a that it's a good idea too to do it, but I wouldn't. I do like the idea of Switzerland's idea of conscription, although they did go to Afghanistan, so their honor is now gone, but, they, I mean, they had 200 years of honor, not involving themselves in jack shit, although now they've been to Afghanistan, so all their honor is gone, but, I mean, no, I mean, the, the legit, only legit country that I know of that you can say those people have honor for not going and smoke-checking people who aren't harming them. Right. Because no American can say that, or no British guy. Shit. No. They're the British are in constant war. They're too busy taking over the world. Who? America and Britain. Yeah. We're like the bastard kid of Great Britain. <laughs> trying to much. Trying to impress the Queen of England. Constantly, yeah. Constantly. America's still beholden to them, which is scary. We're still sucking our teeth, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Pay attention to me, Queen. <laughs> Ah, yeah, Belize has set a minimum age for voluntary recruitment into the armed forces at 18. And that happened in 77. Conscription has never been conscribed in the Defense Act, but is at the Governor General's discretion in Belize. Hmm, Belize. Ugh, man, that's just fucking creepy. In Canada, conscription has never taken place in peacetime. Conscription became a very controversial issue during World War One and World War Two, especially in the province of Quebec. Yeah, they've got some major issues with... I mean, Canada itself being America's hat, um, <laughs> and basically northern, northern Ohio and northern Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, <laughs> they have a huge problem because, you know... I would say, if you look back at the what happened during the Iraq War, you'd probably have maybe 85% of the population of Canada not approving of going to war. Right. I, I mean, that. I mean, even a general poll calling up 30 people on opposite sides of of Canada. That's that would be the, the prevailing idea. I don't know. My idea of an ideal society. Yeah, what is yours? I, myself, am an anarchist. Anarcho capitalist, libertarian, do whatever the fuck you want kind of guy. Uh, so, I would say that I, I, my concept of liberty includes that you own your body. So, if you own your body, you can't be conscripted. And that's a hard one to swallow for many Christians, because many Christians don't actually believe in liberty that God owns your body. Mm -hmm. So there's more Christians, I think, that are beholden to the model of, say, using government for God's will to enact uh, freedom and democracy for people to uh, liberate them from their evil leaders. I don't agree with that. Right. At least for me, I would say that, like, and I wouldn't even say having a federalized state is even a good plan. I say, because even in a big country like, say, America, if you if you said, this is an anarchist nation, uh, let's have anarchy in the whole place, you would have people struggling for power in certain areas, so really the only way to be able to have an anarchist state which it wouldn't be a state. It, I mean, it would just be a, a, a agreements. So you'd have status of forces agreements with every town and every, like, city. 
I think the first thing would be not having an actual military, having localized militias and security companies. And then everything else, you know, who will build the roads? You know, that's where Parsons and fucking Dynecore come in, you know, like all the big KBR, the evil companies, you know, who will build the roads is always this crazy ass. Anybody who comes against libertarianism or anarchism, like, you know, says stupid, someone in the back, you know, some guy with a muffled voice, who built the roads, you know, like, <laughs> so I, I start with the military first. The military first is Eric Prince, Mr. Blackwater, can start up a militia, sends out some Switzerland guy, or super sweet accounting marine, mm-hmm. it's like, hey, here's how you use an M4, and here's how you account for it. Because you're the only guy that actually can do that that I know. Uh, <laughs> here's how you do your taxes and use an M4. Jose for president. Um, <laughs> God, we need to get like an American flag and then get you like in a suit and like <laughs> like a sweet like political picture, you know. And then find a baby. We could do like a whole political campaign for you. That'd be hilarious. Make a bunch of photos, you know, of you like as like <laughs> walking in some sort of like. Uh, warehouse, you know, like, with a suit, you know, with, like, the, 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 the shirt things rolled up, you know, like, a hard hat on, you know, you kissing a baby, fucking crazy-ass political shit. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, you just set up a bunch of, like, militia things that just, you know, they, they're not allowed to, they're not allowed to actually, uh, be a military, a formed military. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything has to work off of donations. That's a cool thing, too. The donation model, the Kickstarter model, the whole idea that you don't have to be a a for-profit military can actually work and benefit to a lot of people, where it could be a non-profit militia institution, which is just people give money for weapons and training and things like that, and, you know, every man and woman of age 18, every week, has to go to a class on how to use a weapon. Mm-hmm. That would be the militia. That's it, <laughs> you know. Right. And signing an agreement that you're not allowed to go invade somebody else, which actually the Swiss have that, which I do respect. Mm-hmm. Their military is actually not allowed to be mercenaries or even work for most American uh, contractor companies. Really? Which they normally just say they're French citizens and they just go do it anyways. <laughs> but <laughs> really, um, you know, and no military, and then you know you could just, and really. If you freedomized, if you opened up freedom, and you didn't have taxes at all, that would be the first start. Mm. No taxes for food. Then you wouldn't need to have WIC, the you know women's infant children uh, taxpayer fund program. You wouldn't need any of the poor programs that we have now because Catholic charities and the Atheists for America whatever atheist organization there are out there, the atheists can help feed and clothe people. I don't see why not. The atheists already do it anyways with the state, so why couldn't they do it without the state? Hmm, I know that. Fuck yeah, man. I mean, like, there's so many charities out there. I mean, even before the 1970s when any of these programs even existed or before the, before the 40s and the Roosevelt stuff, you know, before all that happened, there was no programs for the poor. There was no programs for the average person either. <laughs> like, there, there wasn't Social Security. There wasn't an income tax. There wasn't Medicaid. There wasn't Medicare. There wasn't even VA benefits. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, and society lived fairly decently before the 19, you know, before the 1930s when the Federal Reserve was instituted. So we weren't off gallivanting everywhere. I mean, sure, we were deposing governments in Mexico and doing crazy ass shit, but still. It wasn't on the scale that it is now. So, I think that's the first thing. No income tax, no formed military, Parsons and Dyncourt could build the roads, and Jose for a global peace leader, I guess. <laughs> peace leader? Yeah, you could go around and you could, you know, you go with your girlfriend around and, you know, she can help a teach the bloody heathens of uh, Afghanistan and of uh, Tajikistan how to not wear burqas. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and you guys can go spread feminism and peace everywhere. <laughs> I'm tired. 
Well, that's been Death Metal Chronicles Naked Edition. Who's naked? <sighs> Fucking Jose. I'm naked. Fuck yeah. My brother. From another mother. Another mother. I completely different. Different families. Different families, different mothers. I love you, Jose. Don't look at my wiener, man. <laughs> Buenas noches, guys. Have a good night.